Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host, and I have Adam here co-hosting the show with me. Wishing everybody a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays, Andy. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas to you, Adam. This week, we're bringing you an episode on spinning up your own virtual lab. During the holidays, maybe you have some downtime. Maybe you're going through a change freeze for your organization. And if you are, you can have some fun and spin up your own virtual lab and play around with different policies, different VMs, and kind of invest in your own education to try and learn something. All the things we're going to talk about today, for the most part, are free or open source. There are some things that you may have to purchase, but there's always going to be a route that you could go to have it cost no money at all. So the first thing we're going to talk about are some of the ways that you can get your hands on cloud SaaS applications that have developer subscriptions. And the first one is probably one of the best ones out there is the Microsoft developer subscription. You can go to developer.microsoft.com and you have to have an MSA, a Microsoft account in order to register to be a developer. But once you do that, you can get a renewable developer e5 license it's renewed every 90 days this is honestly awesome because it is practically everything you would have in a microsoft 365 tenant like your organization probably has it's full office 365 e5 enterprise mobility and security e5 the only thing that's not included here is a windows license for like windows enterprise but andy's got some ways to test that otherwise and so when we say everything we mean everything if you want to stand up an exchange environment and poke at transport rules or mailbox e-discovery or data retention or sensitivity labels, you want to mess with email security tools like Defender for Office 365, it's all here. If you want to set up Intune and enroll devices in Intune and test that out, again, that's all included. Conditional access policies with Azure AD, it's there too. So there's a ton here. If you want to get your hands on it, understand how all the pieces work, how everything fits together, and maybe you're at an organization where that's normally all parted out and there's different areas of responsibility, or you just want to understand how how it all ties together and have your hands in everything yourself. This is a great skill to have to understand how a Microsoft 365 tenant works. I would say for me, it's one of the best career development things I ever got to do was be that person who was in charge of a Microsoft 365 environment end to end. Having that understanding from identity through mailboxes, through SharePoint, through OneDrive, and all the way to Intune is something I've carried with me my whole career because I had to understand how all the pieces fit together. And it's it's really benefited me. So this is a great option. And there's several other SaaS services that have great developer accounts as well. And the next one I'd like to mention, Andy, is Salesforce. I personally use the Salesforce developer account just to tie into my Azure AD in my sandbox for Microsoft. So I can stand up that single sign-on behavior and I can test that out and, and get comfortable with that. But there's way more you can do with a Salesforce dev environment. It's pretty darn full featured as well. And Andy, I think there's a couple others you wanted to mention too. Yeah, I have a Box developer account as well, mainly because my company uses Box and I want to try to learn about the admin console that way because I'm not a full admin. And I also onboard Box to my Microsoft developer subscription using Azure AD for single sign-on, and then I can apply conditional access rules and Microsoft Cloud App Security rules. But I do want to back up just a quick bit so that if you haven't been a global admin before in Azure Tenant, this is essentially what you get to do. You are the global admin admin for your own developer tenant. And I mean, you can start with some of the security rules, but you can also do other cool things like, for example, onboard your own custom domain. When you first start off with a Microsoft Azure tenant, you automatically get to the domain, whatever you stated it was, let's say it's andyjaw.onmicrosoft.com. So that's generally your, your base one. But if you've never configured your own custom domain to an exchange mailbox before, this is a great way 
way to start. And then, of course, all the other things that I'm talked about, information protection, Microsoft Cloud App Security, conditional access rules, Office ATP. It even comes with Azure ATP, which is now called Microsoft Defender for Identity. And then there's a couple of other developer subscriptions that I have. I haven't done a whole lot with them, but you can get an AWS dev subscription as well as an Okta dev subscription. And I'm sure there's tons of other ones out there. Dropbox, I know, has a developer subscription that you can get. So whatever tool or SaaS application that you're looking at, most likely they'll have some sort of dev environment with some limited functionality that you can get a free environment to And what I generally do is I stand up my Microsoft developer tenant first, set up email, and then I sign up for all the dev subscriptions and send it to that email so I'm not getting bombarded in my other inboxes for their sales folks that are trying to sell you stuff as soon as you stand up a developer environment. And I'd like to shame one SaaS provider for having a terrible dev environment, and that is ServiceNow. Theirs is terrible. It's difficult to sign up for. It does not auto-renew. I was It's like a manual renewal, and it's something like every five days or seven days or something insane. And so it's like, why would I want to invest any time or effort in that if it could all go poof because they got busy for a week? So shame on them. I would like to see a longer period of time. I mean, 30 days wouldn't even be terribly unreasonable, just in case I got busy or or lost track of what I was working on there. It's pretty limited for a developer account. So most of the ones we talked about are pretty generous. That would be my exception. So moving on from SaaS apps, most lab environments include virtual machines. And you can run these on any type of hardware that you currently own at home. My recommendation would be to get something that is specifically for running these type of virtual machines. A lot of people will build a little tower or custom computer that has specs that are made for running virtual machines. If you don't have that, I mean, you can run them on any type of hardware. It may just slow down your host when you're running the VMs and you may only be able to run one or two at a time. But just as a general specification, you probably want to have a CPU of an i5, eight cores or more, 16 to 32 gigs of RAM, and I'd say around 200 to 500 gigs of free disk space. When you're standing up servers or Linux machines, they don't require a ton of resources. When I do my AD controllers or Linux VMs, I usually spec them to about two cores, two gigs of memory, and about 20 to 30 gigs of disk space. And that's kind of the bare minimum. You can definitely go more. Some of my Windows VMs I run at four or eight gigs of RAM. Depending on if I'm actually storing things on the VM, you can go up to 60 or 100 gigs of disk space. But just know that as you're doing that and as you're running them, they take up resources on the host machine. One thing to think about that's an option as well, and you wouldn't want to do this for a VM that you need running 24 by 7, but if you do become hard up for a way to virtualize a couple of machines for a limited period of time, something that you might only spin up when you want to use it, the cloud computing platforms are actually a great option for this as well, whether that's AWS or Azure. You can spin up a VM, and if it's pretty modestly specced, and you're not going to store a ton of stuff, and you're not going to transfer a ton of stuff over the network, they can be very inexpensive. Yes, there's going to be some cost in involved, but it's going to be minimal. And if you really just want to have that elastic compute where you can spin up compute resources as you need them and then turn them off when you're done, that's another option as well. You could do this easily for probably under 50, bucks a month. If you just want to spin up a lab and just have some machines running some of the time, pretty straightforward. It might even be less than that. You know, obviously talk to your cloud computing platform about that, but just as another option where maybe you don't want to invest in a whole lot of hardware and you don't currently have it, run your like AD environment with an on-premises server that you can keep running all the time because keeping it on costs money. Um, But for things you might turn on and turn off, again, cloud computing platforms, that's another option. People don't think about those. They think, you know, they're only for big business or enterprise, but there's nothing stopping you, person listening to our podcast, from getting an Azure account and spinning up a couple VMs that is accessible to anyone. That's a good call out. I remember when I was doing that initially when I worked for Microsoft and there was a chargeback. So I was pretty conscious of how much I was spending. And if you're only spinning up like a Windows 10 machine and maybe a server and then you spin it down, maybe you're just doing the work. And that's what I generally do at my home lab as well. I don't usually keep my VMs running. I spin them up. I do the work. I I test some things and then I, I usually take them down. The cost of that is usually in the pennies. You're talking maybe a 
you know, $5, $10 at most a month if you're really putting in some time. But a couple hours on some modest VMs in Azure is not going to be that expensive. It's probably less than a Netflix subscription. Okay, well, then I overestimated it, which is funny, but that's a great call out too. Um, yeah, absolutely. If they're modestly spec'd and you're not keeping them running and you're not storing a lot and you're not transmitting a lot, there's just there's not a lot to really make that meter spin. So that's a good call. So when it comes to virtualization, you're going to want some sort of virtualization platform. And depending on what operating system you're running as the host, there's a couple of different options that you can go with. For Windows, if you're running Windows Pro or Windows Enterprise, it has a built-in virtualization platform called Hyper-V. And this is something that you can just go into the optional features and enable. It layers the Hyper-V platform underneath the Windows 10 operating system. You can spin up VMs using images that you have for each operating system just through the Hyper-V virtualization platform. You can also purchase VMware workstations, but it is a perpetual license, I believe. There is no subscription, but it is around, I think, $150 to $200 for the license for a single machine. And then, of course, there's the open source product that is very popular called VirtualBox. If you don't have Windows 10 Pro or Enterprise, you can use VirtualBox. It is very good. I've used it for years on several of my home labs. There are some limitations, but you generally don't run into them initially when you're starting to learn. So it's definitely a good option to start with if you don't have a Pro license or Enterprise license and you don't want to pay for VMware workstations. Just go to VirtualBox, download it, install it on Windows 10, and get your ISOs and you can start spinning up VMs. And VirtualBox is pretty good. I've used it a time or two. And, you know, sometimes open source software is functional, but it doesn't have all the rough edges smoothed off. I was really impressed that there aren't a lot of rough edges. It's it's a pretty darn good product. And, you know, VirtualBox is also available on the Macintosh, by the way, as an open platform. But VMware has a tool on the Mac as well. It's called VMware Fusion. Most commonly, that is used to run Windows on the Mac. But, of course, it can be used to run other virtual machines as well. And then there's a product on the Macintosh called Parallels, which is kind of a competitive product to VMware Fusion, and they both do more or less the same thing. So if you have a, a strong aversion to one or the other, you know, the other product's fine. If you can get a better deal on one, that's fine too. They're both commercial products, but they're both very, very, very good good products and and highly recommend them. One interesting thing to note about the Mac is that you can run a virtualized instance of Mac OS, but you have to run it on Mac hardware. That's part of Apple's license agreement. So if you have interest in virtualizing Mac OS, that is now possible, which by the way, that was not allowed in the past. So now you can, but you have to do that on Apple hardware. So just keep that in mind if that's something you desire to do. And then also keep in mind, and, and I don't want to go down this rabbit hole, but Apple is in the midst of a architecture transition for their CPUs. So since about 2006, Macintoshes have run Intel CPUs, the same as Windows PCs, and Apple has just begun to ship Macintoshes that run their own Apple Silicon. And while those Apple Silicon Macs will still support virtualization, the operating systems you run in them will, of course, need to run on ARM-based CPUs. And so as of right now, it is not possible possible to obtain a copy of Windows that runs on ARM-based CPUs. So depending on what you want to virtualize on your Mac, just keep that in mind what architecture it comes with. If it's the new Apple M1 chip or Apple Silicon, or most Macs still ship with Intel CPUs and make your decisions appropriately. So once you get the platform that you're going to virtualize all your machines on, you have to get the images. To get Windows images, there's a Windows Evaluation Center, and you can download images for servers, for Windows 10 clients. You can also do SCCM, as well as some other server tools, like SQL Database. Go to Windows Evaluation Center, and you have to fill out some information, and you can download versions of server and Windows 10. The server licenses for evaluation last 180 days for Windows 10 clients clients, they last 90 days. And that's generally enough, you know, to get your lab spun up. And you just know that after that time, you have to destroy and and rebuild. But it's a good practice to kind of go through that exercise. There's also different PowerShell scripts that you can find out there to quickly spin back a lab if you need to. So I'll put in an article that I found that has a link to a GitHub with some PowerShell scripts that you can easily spin up an AD controller and get all the roles installed.
installed right away once you s start up your server. Other popular images that you can get are Linux distros. So in information security, there is a popular one called Kali. And if you're in information security, you should get familiar with the Kali distro for Linux. This has a lot of built-in tools for pen testing, tools that information security folks will usually download and install, but it comes built into the Kali image right away. So I highly recommend getting used to that. You can also download Ubuntu. And then there's another security one that's very similar to Kali that has a, a circle of followers called Parrot OS. Same concept, just built on a different backend of Linux. Parrot OS has a lot of the security tools as well that are all built in. And then finally, you can also just get Android images and download those and spin up VMs of Android if you want to do any type of pen testing. Or in this case, you could also enroll those Android phones into conditional access. If you don't have an Android phone, go ahead and spin one up. And it's an easy way to enroll a phone and, and see how that works. And for the Mac, those images for the operating system are going to be in the Mac App Store. And I think there is an Apple support document that links to older versions of the operating system, but no licensing to have to deal with because remember, you're running it on an already properly licensed Macintosh. And so you don't need an additional license to run that in a virtual machine. The underlying license on the hardware is sufficient for running virtualized Mac OS. One of the concepts that you'll need to adjust to when you're using VMs is the networking. When it comes to networking and you're installing a VM, it has to get its internet access from either the host or directly through a network interface card that is on your host. If you don't plan on connecting to the internet, then just disable the networking altogether. And you can run those lab machines internally on their own intranet. And that's perfectly okay. Sometimes that's the best way to do it if you're just doing information security stuff and you want to purposely infect machines or misconfigure them and do some pen testing. But if you do need to get out to the internet, there's a couple of different terms that you're going to have to get used to when it comes to networking. There's NAT, which is Network Address translation and that generally uses the internet connection that you have for your host but then has a DHCP server for the virtualization software that you're using and it'll put your VMs on its own subnet that is separate from your IP address subnets for your host. So it translates them to its own subnet, very similar to how your router translates your external ISP given IP address to your own internal 192.168.1.1 or whatever it is. And so it'll usually put your VMs on its own subnet, still able to route back to the host if needed, but they're on their own separate VLAN. You can also use what's called a bridge networking, which then puts your VM on the same subnet as your host. So it'll appear as its own machine on the same network. And sometimes this can be advantageous if you actually want to see it as another machine on the same network as all of your other machines. There's not one right way or wrong way to do it. It all depends on what you're trying to do. If you're going to do bridge networking for your VMs, you generally want to have multiple NICs or network interface cards. That means, for example, on my laptop, I have an Ethernet port and I also have a Wi-Fi card. I can use my VMs to connect and bridge that connection for my Wi-Fi while it, my laptop is connected to the Ethernet. So my host is getting my internet from my Ethernet and then my VMs are getting their internet access using the Wi-Fi card. The VMs will appear as machines on the same subnet as my host. So those are the terms that I want to introduce to you if you aren't, aren't familiar with networking is NAT and bridge and those are the generally the two different networking configurations that you can run for VMs. When I'm testing things and I want to keep them off the, the network of my main machines, I use NAT. If I need to test things for example, scan hosts that are on my normal subnet, I'll use Bridged. So I had an interesting experience with NAT working with Hyper-V. So I had enabled Hyper-V on my Surface Book, and I had NAT enabled so that my Surface Book and any VMs could share my Wi-Fi connection, because day-to-day, -day, that's all I had connected. And for the most part, it worked fine. 
But every now and then I would go to a customer site and I had no internet connectivity. I could not make their Wi-Fi work. In a lot of places, it like wouldn't show the captive page. You know, it's supposed to show the welcome to Contoso, accept our policy to use our guest network and then put in a password or something. That wouldn't pop up a lot of times. And so what I figured out is that when I was on NAT, I was sending like multiple requests and possibly even using like bogus MAC addresses or something weird. And their network devices were just completely freezing me out and not letting me in at all. So I I just tried to operate in that mode all the time because, you know, it was better than having to like mess with virtual switch settings anytime I wanted to spin up my VM. And I was trying to use it to demo some technology and found out the hard way. So I know people aren't traveling and going to different enterprise customers right now, but if and or when we do start traveling again, and hopefully this podcast has a long shelf life, just something to keep in mind is you might not want those virtual switch settings enabled all of the time because they can cause weird behavior on certain networks. They'll probably work fine on your home network, but if you ever start to travel around again, I bet you'd have some of the similar problems at like hotels and, and other places, coffee shops that use captive portals. They just didn't like the way that behaved. So just an interesting anecdote that happened to me. And if it happens to you now, you know why. Once you get your lab all spun up, the next thing is, what can you do with it? For me, I spin up my own Active Directory controllers because that is something that when you're in a production environment, you generally don't want to be messing around with. And it's hard to quote unquote learn how to do things in on-prem AD in a production environment. It's not really the, the area that you want to learn on because if you do something wrong, it's going to affect a lot of people. So it's pretty easy to spin up your own AD. You know, as long as you have a copy of server, you install the roles and then you spin it up and you start adding in users. You can create users, you can create different roles, you can delegate permissions, you can delegate group policies, you can create group policies. I do this often where if I need to test a specific group policy that I want to use, I can create the group policy in my AD controller, launch my Windows 10 domain joined machine that's joined to that domain and do a GP update and make sure that it works okay. You can also set up your own AD sync to the developer subscription. That is something that I did as well. You know, that's a great exercise to walk through to understand how AD sync works. You can sync your password hashes, do hybrid Azure AD join for your devices by syncing your device OUs. It's a great learning experience to configure your own AD sync and and walk through that as well. If you're looking to learn System Center, you can spin up your own SCCM server. I'm certainly not a System Center expert, but there's a lot of different guides out there that'll walk you through how to do a greenfield deployment for an SCCM server. And you can start using that to deploy software, to do Windows updates. You know, If you're learning how to do sysadmin, this is a great way to learn how to do it without having to work on it in a production environment. Along the same notes as SCCM, you can also try managing Windows devices with Intune. I mean, you could also do Android devices or iPhones as well, but certainly Intune for managing Windows devices, you can try the group policy analytics, dump your group policies from your organization and see how they map to Intune policies, test that out. You could Azure AD join your devices. So you can try that cloud join model and see how that behaves. You can enroll your mobile devices. You could try to pen test them. So plug in your Android, your iPhone, enroll it in your Intune environment and your dev environment and see if you can exfiltrate data, test that out. You could also configure Microsoft Cloud App Security. You could monitor your Microsoft 365 environment. You could try to evade detections in that. You could try to tune detections in it. You could connect that to some of the other dev instances we talked about. Connect it to your box dev instance, connect it to your Salesforce dev instance and monitor the behavior over there too. So Those are a couple of things to kind of think about and and look at. And then you could even try using Microsoft Cloud App Security policies to differentiate between if a device is healthy and managed by Intune versus not and creating different policies for that too. I know in one of your videos, Adam, you use a dev environment for Salesforce to demonstrate MCAS policies where if you're trying to download something, it'll encrypt it on the fly with Azure Information Protection or block a download specifically. You can do it by file type or just by 
all different files that MCAS can monitor. I've also seen you demonstrate sign-in risk where you connect to Azure AD and it doesn't prompt you for multi-factor and then you connect through a, a Tor node and try to authenticate and then it goes through conditional access because your sign-in risk has been elevated and it prompts you for a multi-factor. Yeah, those are two great examples of things you can test in an environment like this because they're relatively straightforward to stand up and all of the controls are pretty easy to access. So the sign-in risk is you really just create a conditional access policy that says if sign-in risk is medium or higher, then prompt for MFA. And then you can kind of test that pretty simply in your lab, go to your Windows 10 client and try signing in both ways and observe the differences. Or the behavior you were talking about, that's a really interesting linkage because the user experience was really seamless, but it's actually connecting Salesforce dev instance to Azure Azure AD through single sign-on, then using a conditional access policy to look for device management with Intune. And if the device is not managed, then sending the connection to Cloud App Security, which then monitors and potentially intercepts downloads and does what you were talking about, applying that Microsoft information protection um, sensitivity label to the document. And so how many different technologies was that we just stitched together? It was um, information protection plus Cloud App Security plus Intune plus Azure AD plus a Salesforce dev instance and stitching all of that together to deliver that seamless experience. These are all things you can test and learn how all the pieces fit together. So that's a really good example. And since the dev environment comes with Office ATP, you can use that and test that with malicious uploads. If you have malware files that are sandboxed, you could try and email that within your dev environment and see if ATP catches them. You want to try to be careful, obviously, when you're when you're dealing with live malware or any type of files that you are considered malicious, because if you're not careful and they're networked to your host machines and your machines that are on your home network, you could inadvertently infect one of them just through network connection. So obviously be careful. You can always disconnect the NIC on the VM and just make sure that it stays within the VM itself. One of the most interesting posts that I saw about an information security lab was misconfiguring AD policies and then pen testing them yourself. So if you're trying to learn the red team stuff, you can use Kali or Parrot and pen test your own AD controller or your Windows 10 client after you've purposely misconfigured them to something that maybe someone might do out in the wild or not apply a specific patch and then pen test it. And then two other things that I've done in my lab that we've talked about on the show previously, password synchronization and password protection, deploying password protection using Azure AD, but also syncing with your on-prem AD controllers. That's a fun exercise to walk through to make sure that that works. And if you haven't deployed that, that was in one of our very first shows, I think that we talked about. That's a great way to harden your password policies. And it's a pretty easy exercise to walk through. And then we've talked about the Microsoft Defender for identity as well. Once you get that agent installed, you can do all sorts of fun stuff within your AD controller or within DNS or whatever it is. And that should catch different alerts and you'll be able to see as you're adding people to privileged groups or doing different PowerShell scripts. If you're calling different commands on your AD controller, Microsoft Defender for Identity should alert you to that and you can test those theories as well. I received this Certified Ethical Hacker certification last year, right around this time, actually. And one of the things you do is they have multiple labs set up where you can go in and test a lot of those red team tools and get comfortable with them, or maybe more <laughs> accurately, uncomfortable with them. And I would say if there's one thing I would I would encourage people, even if you, you really have never gotten into the whole you know red team thing, ethical hacking thing in the past, which, by the way, I'm not terrible into myself. So don't feel bad. You can you can still be a security practitioner if, if that sort of thing doesn't light your fire. But one of the most enlightening things I was asked to do as part of that certification was learn all of the scary things that happen in and around user hashes, password hashes in a Windows environment and how easy it is to get an endpoint to send a hash to you. And then the options for brute forcing that hash using a rainbow table against the hash are all super, super interesting. So, you know, if, if I wanted to have one plug for what can you do with your uh, shiny new lab you just spun up, get familiar 
and get comfortable, or like I said, maybe uncomfortable with all of those processes and how they work. And then when you're done, go back to your enterprise and turn on credential guard in your real world environment. It doesn't eliminate the threat, but it certainly does help diminish it. And so play around with Mimi Cats, play around with John the Ripper, learn all of the things you can do with hashes. If, if there's one kind of go do from me to your lab environment, it's that because it's, it's interesting, it's scary, and it's knowledge you can carry with you. I was having a conversation with a customer the other day, and they were talking about how they use self-encrypting drives on their PCs, and then they use a tool to synchronize their user passwords to those self-encrypting drives. And I thought, man, that's interesting because Active Directory passwords and all those hashes, if I can steal your hash, I can go do an offline attack on it. I can go try to brute force it on my machine. I can go try to match it with a rainbow table on my machine. So now all of those great anti-hammering, anti-brute force controls, hardware controls that are in those self-encrypting drives, you've essentially defeated them by yourself because all I have to do instead of trying to brute force your drive is I'll just steal your hash somehow. I'll, I'll fish you or spearfish you or somehow gain access to your device, steal your hash, go break that offline. I don't even need access to your device anymore. Then I can show up to your laptop and get your password on the first try and log right in, even if you had to power it off. And having that knowledge of like how hashes work allowed me to kind of think through the risks involved with that. And so that's a great example of something you can do as you spin up your lab is start to find holes in things that on the surface might not appear to have them because self-encrypting drives, hardware drives do have very strong anti-hammering, anti-brute force controls that are literally implemented in silicon. And so they're really, really hard to defeat. But, you know, security is only as strong as your weakest link. And if you're using user passwords for that, well, there's an example. So a little bit of a soapbox thing there, Andy, but I, I was just kind of putting all the pieces together. And I will say that's one of the most compelling and interesting things I learned when I had access to a lab environment for my certified ethical hacker. Yeah, that's a good call out with the, the password cracker, because that was something that we actually walked through at one of my companies that I was with as more of a demonstration on weak passwords. And if we were able to get the the password file, there's a specific file within an active directory that has all of your hashed passwords. And we got the, the file from our organization just to test. We used a, a shadow copy of AD and, and got the file. And then we ran John the Ripper against it. And I think we only went up to about eight characters. We brute forced up to eight characters for the entire organization. But in that exercise, we got, I can't remember exactly how many, but it was it was a couple hundred cracked passwords just using that over, a, I think, a week or two weeks of time. So that was a fun exercise to walk through as well. And then when we got the passwords, we could show them, you know, these are the passwords that were cracked. We didn't attribute them to the users, but we said if they were on this list, you probably need to change them. So John the Ripper is stupid fast. I mean, that crazy product, how quickly that rips through everything. And, you know, that's also because those hashes aren't salted, too. That helps it operate a lot more quickly because you're just doing a mathematical algorithm over and over and over again. And CPUs are really, really good at that. So it's scary, man. Yeah. So a lot of things you can do with a lab. Hopefully we've given you some ideas. This is coming out on Christmas. So if you have some free time, take a look at some of the links that we're putting in our show notes, walk through and spin up your own lab. And hopefully you can learn how to do sysadmin in the cloud, on-prem, Kali, pen testing stuff, whatever it is that you want to do. So spin up your lab, get learning and have a great holiday. As always, thanks for listening to our episode. If you have any questions or if there's a security topic that you want us to talk about or ask our opinion on, just send us a DM on Twitter or a message on LinkedIn. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.